<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Appreciate your being here. Elliot is gone today. He and his family are enjoying a few days' vacation during the spring break. He needs rest, and we're glad to see that he has an opportunity to do that. Before we get started, I need each of you who are sitting on the insides of these pews, if you will look inside the fold of the pews, there's an envelope. And over here on this side, if you will pick those up, please, open that up and you will find some refrigerator magnets in those. Just tear that open and just pass out one per family and we'll... Uh, use that as a launching pad for our lesson this morning. <clears throat> These are refrigerator magnets. They even have a magnet pictured on them. <clears throat> These are to be placed on your refrigerator. Now we all know that our refrigerator has about three different classes of space. Class one space is that spot where you put things that are urgent. Things like, I have a dental appointment today. I have a doctor's appointment today. I'm supposed to pick up the kids at 4 o'clock today. I've got to pay the electric bill. Those things that are vital. That's class one space. We have class two space. That's where we have the pictures of our kids or pictures that our children or grandchildren have colored or painted at school. We put those on there. And pictures of our other family members that are close and special to us. That's class two space. Class three space is that space where upcoming things that we need to remember eventually, but nothing urgent, like wedding announcements, other kinds of announcements, we stick over there by the side. Maybe some little quibs that we like to read every now and then, things that are not all that important. These go on class one space, all right? They are important. <clears throat> Brian Benton has put together a refrigerator magnet enforcement squad. He will be coming to your home unannounced when you least expect him to see that your magnet is properly displayed on your refrigerator. Now I know some of you are saying, well, what if I don't put it up there? You do not want to know. <laughs> Let me just say, Remember in the Old Testament when the death angel passed over to see if the blood was on the doorpost? <laughs> Something like that. I'm not going to tell you anything this morning that you don't already know. My purpose this morning is to try to get you to remember some of the important things that you already know that are vital to your survival as a Christian. Every culture in every part of the world, in every society, has a sense of right and wrong. Even among the thieves, there is a code of ethics. Now, everyone doesn't agree what is right and wrong, but there is that inborn drive in us to know that there's something right and something wrong. God has put that into every human being. I remember when I was a child going to the movies at eight, nine, ten years old. And back then I could go for ten cents. If you were 12 or older, it was a quarter. Back then, most of the movies were westerns. And there was always the good guys and the bad guys. And the bad guys were always fighting against the good guys. And the bad guys wore black hats. And the good guys wore white hats. And you felt so good when you left every Western movie that the good guys have won without fail. In the 60s, the Star Wars movies came out. They were popular everywhere. And as I watched that first Star Wars movie, and I don't go to a lot of movies, but back then I watched that movie, it was so obviously clear that one of the main themes of those series of movies is there is a bad force and there is a good force. There is the emperor who depicts all of the evil and the selfishness and the greed and pride that Satan stands for. He even looked evil wearing that dark 
hooded robe, and Darth Vader, his right-hand man, was just like him. And then we had Luke Skywalker on the good side, and Yoda, that little funny-looking creature who had the special power. So the force representing the good uh, opposing the evil. I think one of the reasons that that was so popular is that there was always this desire in those people watching that to see the good side win. We are aware that no matter who we are, that driving force of good and evil exists. <clears throat> we want to be on the good side. We want to be over here representing what is righteous. Why is it then that we find ourselves so often <clears throat> over here where we shouldn't be? You say, well, it's that temptation thing. And it is that thing that causes us to be pulled over here and to be enticed, to be tempted by our own evil desire. And when that evil desire comes to fruition, then it brings forth sin. That is tough for us to deal with. We are aware that it exists, but yet we still yield to it. We don't have to. Because the Bible tells us that with every temptation, God will provide a way of escape. Why don't we take that way of escape? Either we're not looking for it, because it's there. God promises us that. Or we just don't want to take that way of escape. How many times in our normal lives, do we feel the pull of the devil? Is it monthly? Is it weekly? Is it hourly? The Bible says that Satan roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And all of you who say that you do not struggle with the influence of Satan are liars. Did you feel the pull? Was there a change of mood? We don't like certain things that make us uncomfortable. And when we get uncomfortable, Satan has an opportunity to pull us to the wrong side. I don't like it, some of you may say, when someone hollers at me. I don't either. When someone hollers at me, uh, that's insulting. And you just hollered at me, and I don't like that. And I don't like when preachers holler at me. I didn't come here to be hollered at. I can wait till I go to work tomorrow and be hollered at by my boss. And if you're going to holler at me, then I'm offended and I'm leaving. Some of us could have felt that. Some of us may say, I don't like being called a liar. That's fighting words. You call me a liar and men, the war is on. That's not... A nice word. And especially don't want to be called a liar by someone who's preaching or someone who's one of my elders. That's, that's just not good. I don't like that. I'm offended. Some of you may have thought, just, I don't like to be called a sinner. Because that's really what he called me, was a sinner. Because he said, Satan is there tempting us, and he implied it if he didn't say it. And I don't like to be called a sinner. He shouldn't be pointing his finger at me and calling me a sinner. The Bible says he's supposed to come to me in the spirit of gentleness and kindness. 
And he owes me an apology, and I'm not coming back until he apologizes. Some of you may have felt, I don't like to admit that I am influenced by Satan. Yeah, I am, but I don't like to admit it. It makes me discouraged. It makes me feel weak. It makes me feel like a failure, and I don't like that. And I don't want someone pointing that out to me. That's discouraging. And I'm not coming up here to be discouraged. And then somebody say, I agree, I, I, he is, right? I am influenced by Satan. But he, he falsely accused me of being a liar. He said, all of you are liars. Well, I really didn't. I just said, all of us who deny that Satan is influencing us uh, are liars. And actually, you know, it, it's not me who's saying that, but John himself says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we claim we have not sinned, we make out him to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. John said that if you claim you have no sin, and you're claiming you're not influenced by Satan, my friend, you're just lying to yourself. If I did offend you, I'm sorry, I apologize. I wanted to make a point. But it's interesting to know that just a few seconds before I made that harsh statement, everything was feeling good. But in just five seconds, five seconds of harsh words, we can open up Satan's Pandora box of opportunity to pull us over to the wrong side. He can do that in so many ways. That's his job. And it affects unfortunately, all of us. Now, if I were to have stopped after I made that harsh statement and just said, let's sing the invitation song, a lot of us would have gone home and all week long we'd have been thinking about how cruel, how harsh and unfair I was in making that statement. And we'd have wrestled with that with a, for a long time. Many of our struggles with Satan do go on for days. Sometimes he approaches us in the most convenient way and we aren't even aware of it. Let me give you a personal example. In the city of Oshkosh, Wisconsin, every year in the last week of July, there is a big aviation event. Anyone who is a pilot or likes flying knows about Oshkosh. It starts on Sunday and goes through the following Sunday. There are approximately 10,000 airplanes each year that go into there. Some of them are on display and others are just people getting there. There's about a half a million people who go through the gates in total during that eight day period. My son and my grandson and I went about 15 years ago and spent a couple days and ever since then I've been wanting to go back. And I would think about it, but never did make the plans until last July when my son was invited to bring his airplane and put it on display. He had purchased a home built at one grand champion in, in the year 2000. I thought, this is an option. We've got to go. It's hard to find a place to stay up there. The motels are booked up weeks in advance. People sleep under their wings of their airplane. There are hundreds of spots on the airport that people rent to stay, and so we decided to take the RV that my son-in-law and daughter own, and we have a small interest. Let's borrow that thing, and we'll go up there, and we'll find a place to stay. Two miles south of the airport was the Circle R campgrounds. Nothing fancy at all. In fact, most of the places where you rent are just water and electricity. There's about a hundred of them. And so I look it up and I find out that we can stay there for $35 a night. Not really worth $35, but it's only two miles away and it's close enough that it'll work for us. And there is a $5 charge for each person with you when you have more than two people. So we arrived there on Sunday afternoon and I stop outside and I go inside the 
general store. That's where you go to register. There's a line of two or three people, and there is the owner, Randy, and then an elderly woman, I would say late 70s or early 80s, also helping to check people in. So I wait my turn, and as it turns out, the elderly lady was open, so I walked up and told her who my name was, that I got a reservation, and she reaches over in her card box and pulls out the reservation. I said, we're going to stay here uh, through Friday night. We'll be here six nights. And so she starts calculating how much things are, and she calculates, and I'm really not able to see exactly what she's doing, but she's got this registration paper, and she's doing some figuring, and she's writing down numbers, and finally she comes up and she says, you owe me $90.70. Sounds a little cheap to me, but I don't okay, there's people behind me, I didn't want to make a scene. So I give her my credit card, she runs it through. We go get hooked up at our spot, and sure enough, it was nothing special. In fact, it was sloped downhill, but just grass. It had been raining a few days, there are a few muddy spots, but you know, it, it's a place to stay. After I get hooked up, I gotta look at that calculation. That just doesn't look right to me. So I got the figuring, and I figured instead of $15, she should have charged us 30. Instead of $129 for six days, she should have charged us 210. And the sales tax was about twice what she had figured. All in all, the total bill should have been $252 minus a $50 deposit that we had paid in earlier. She undercharged me $111.30. Well, we've got several days to take care of this. I'm not gonna go back right now. People are coming in uh, and I'll not bother her. I'll just handle it later. The next day, Craig and I get up and we go into the festival. Linda stays at the RV. She does some knitting and all and we get back home in the evening and uh, she says the electric was off all afternoon and it was hot. The generator on the RV didn't work. We didn't know that till the, light be the night before when we tried it. But there she was in the heat of the day in the hot RV without electricity. You know, this place may not be worth $35 a night. Uh, maybe what I was charged was fair. The next day, Craig and I go in, come home, and it says the electric was off another two or three hours this afternoon. Now I know I've not overpaid. I mean, this place, really, I mean, it's a place to stay, but that's about it. No, that's, that's not right. That, she misfigured. I need to take care of this later on. So every day or two, didn't have time to go. I thought, last day's coming up. Friday night, I thought, I've got to go talk to this guy. Turns out, Saturday morning, before I get around to it. And so I'm unhooking the RV putting the bicycles on the back of the rack, and I'm thinking, okay, now, should I, should I tell these guys that they have undercharged me or not? I know that by rights, I owe them $111.30, but this is really not worth what I'm paying for it. And besides that, I don't want to embarrass this old lady. If the owner finds out she undercharged me, she may lose her job. Or she may be his mother-in-law or his mother, and even though he wouldn't fire her, it would be so disheartening for her to know that she made another mistake. When we get old, you know, we make mistakes and it bothers us, and for her to find this out, this could crush her. I, I just don't know whether I really should do this or not. But I remember very vividly as I was putting that together, this thought came to my mind. I thought, you know, I do not want to stand before God in Judgment Day and God say, Bob, you remember in Oshkosh that $111.30 and you didn't go back and correct 
Okay, I'm going to go. So I take the bill, and I walk into the shop, and sure enough, Randy's there. I say, Randy, uh, I think there's a mistake on my bill. Well, you know, he was on the defensive to start with, you know. I said, I said you did not charge me enough. Oh, really? So I handed him the bill. Randy looks at it, and he says, I said, you know, there were three of us, and we were here six days to start with. So he says, um, so, and that $15, he said, are you, are you going to uh, be here next year? I said, well, I don't know, but if I come back, I will, probably will stay here, and don't worry about the $15. I'm all free, right? I gave him a chance. I showed him the, law, the, the bill. I said, you did not charge me enough, and he says, forget it. No, Randy, look at the rest of the bill. And so he begins to look at it and figures up, and finally, after a couple of minutes, he agrees, yeah, you owe me $111.30. And so I hand him a credit card and he rings it up. Could I have gotten by with that? Absolutely. But I felt so much better having stood up for what was right and paid him his $111. The pull of the undertow of this water out here at Keystone Dam is probably greater than we realize. About 50 years ago, my cousin, Fred Jones, was working for the wildlife department. He and six and five other of his buddies were in two boats. They were on this side of the dam, and they were doing something with the fish, tagging them or something, I don't know. And they were having to stay away from the dam a good distance so that they weren't pulled into the dam where it's very, very dangerous because of the undertow. The boat that my cousin Fred was in malfunctioned. The pin came out of the shaft, and so although the motor was running, the propeller wasn't running. And his boat began to be pulled closer in towards the waters where the water was coming out of the dam. The other three people finally noticed it, and they came with their boat, but by that time, they were so close, the boats turned over, all the men were forced underwater at the mercy of the churning undercurrent. Five of them came up with their life jackets still on, banged up by being slammed against the rocks. But my cousin Fred did not come up until about three or four days later where they found him a few miles downstream. He had his life jacket on, but it wasn't buttoned securely. That undertow of waters like this can be more dangerous than we probably realize. But the undertow of Satan's pull also may be more dangerous than we realize. The Bible tells us about getting entangled and ensnared and trapped in all of the devices that Satan throws at us. And when that happens, we become like those guys in the undercurrent. We have no control. We are just caught in the power that cannot be overcome by our own desires. This is what caught David. I'm not going to go into great detail, but you remember when David stood in his palace and he looked down and he saw this beautiful woman, Bathsheba. And you know the story? He said, that woman is good looking. I'm going to have my servants go get her. And so they did. They brought her to him. He lay with her and she became pregnant. When she became pregnant, David had to do something about it. So he sends for Uriah, Uriah, her husband, tries to entice him to go to his house and sleep with her. <coughs> didn't work. He tried again. It didn't work. And finally, David says, I've got to do something about this. When he was so entangled in this, in this he sends a message to Joab, uh, his <coughs> army commander, and says, Joab, take Uriah, put him in the most fierce battle, and then withdraw from him. And that's what happened, and Uriah basically was murdered by David's 
command. When we get wrapped up in all of the sin that Satan throws at us, we will do things that we would not, under normal circumstances, even think about doing. What do you think would happen if two days before David saw Bathsheba, Joab had come into David's palace and said, David, I got a favor to ask. And David said, what is it? He said, I want you to kill, your, or let me kill Uriah. David said, what are you talking about? Uriah is one of my mighty men. Has he committed treason? Is he showing signs of weakness? Has he threatened you? No, no, but I want him killed. Well, why, Joab, do you want him killed? Because his wife is pretty. And if I get rid of him, then I'll have a shot at her. Joab, are you hearing what you're saying? You're crazy. Get out of here. No way would David have done that. But once he got entangled with all the mess that he did, he was guilty of that very thing. The time is running out, so I'm not going to talk about that. Which is the stronger power? We know that they both exist. Without a doubt, God's power is stronger. How do we know that? Just by speaking, the universe was created by the power of God. Time after time, we see Christ expelling the demons from those demoniacs who had been invaded by Satan's demons. They didn't even argue with him. Christ would say, get out, and they did. They recognized him as being the authority, the Son of God. The power of God is definitely stronger than that of the devil. In fact, you'll find on your little refrigerator magnet where James says, if you'll resist the devil, he will flee from you, but if you draw near to God, then he will draw near to you. And we see that very man David, who messed up later when he became king, exercising this very thing. I keep hitting the wrong button. You remember when Saul was trying to kill David? Two times he made direct attempts at his life. And now as David and his men were out and about trying to stay away from Saul, Saul finds out where David is. And he takes 3,000 of his men and he comes to the place where he heard David was staying among the cricks and the crevices and the caves and Saul goes into the cave to relieve himself, and he didn't know that David and his men were in the cave deeper inside. And David's men say to him, this is the day the Lord spoke of, when he said to you that I will give your enemies into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. What an opportunity. Here is King Saul who set out and put forth great effort to kill David. And David had the opportunity to do that. And David took his sword and walked towards Saul secretly and could have cut off his head as he had the heads of many others that he had killed in battle. But instead... David said, I can't do this. Anybody else would have. Any other man would have seen this as an opportunity to put an end to your enemy trying to take your life. But David said, no, I will not do such a thing to someone that God has anointed. And he goes out then after Saul leaves the cave. He shows Saul what it he had done. Saul, here is the corner of your robe. I could have killed you. You've heard that I'm after you, that I'm your enemy. I'm not. I could have taken your life, and I didn't. <coughs> and he even felt bad about having done that because it was in some way 
a reflection on uh, disrespecting God's anointed. What was that power that kept David uh, from taking the life of his enemy Saul? His love and respect for God. I'm not sure exactly how this works, how God draws us to him when we draw closer to him. But the Bible says it, it works. Maybe it is the love that God shows us. There is no power greater than that of love. Think about it. Husbands will die for their wives. Mothers will die for their children. God sent his son to die for us because of his love for us. The love of God outpowers the hate of Satan any day of the week. And God's promises no doubt help us to want to draw near to him. God said, if you'll just follow me, if you'll do what I tell you, if you will obey my commands, if you'll make me your God, I'll give you everything you could ever need. I'll take care of you. You'll be my children. And you'll have an inheritance throughout eternity above what you can ever imagine. That's a promise that God made, and God keeps his promises. Does Satan make promises? Oh, yeah. Satan says, if you just do this, you'll be happy. And we do that, and we're not happy. Satan says, if you'll do this my way, you'll feel better. We do it his way, and we don't feel better. Satan says, just come along with me, and everything will be all right. And we come along with him, and nothing is right. Let me ask you this. If you went to a car dealer to buy a used car, and he sold you this car, said, this car is great. There's nothing wrong with it. It'll last you for years. You take that car out, and two weeks later, the motor blows up. You go back to the same car and you say, this thing was a piece of junk. I'm sorry, but I've got this other car. Now, this one I know is okay. I've had it checked over. The men have dri I've driven it myself for a month. It is a perfect vehicle. You buy it from him. Two weeks later, the transmission falls out. You go back and you say, this is a pile of junk. Well, it may be, but hey, this car here, now this one I know is great. Take this car, and I promise you, you'll never have a problem with it. You take the car, you drive it. Two weeks later, the front end falls out. Are you going to go back to him again? Of course not. And yet we keep going back because Satan keeps promising us something that he will never deliver. The good conscience that we have when we draw near to God is a powerful thing. Just think about it. Whenever you do what is right, you've got a decision to make. I'm pulled over here to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and do what's right. When you do that, isn't it a good feeling? When you have to make a decision about not doing what you need to do and doing what you need to do, and you do it, you just feel better about it. And we feel a little bit closer to God because we did the right thing. Flee from Satan, and he'll go away. Draw near to God, and we'll be closer to God. We don't have to be over there. We can be right here under God's power and his protection if we want to be. My purpose this morning is to try to get you to do something to make you aware constantly that there's always, every hour of the day, there is a pull in the wrong direction, but there's also a pull in the right direction. I don't care what it is you do. If you think that refrigerator magnets will help, put them on your refrigerator. If you don't, throw it away. But find something. You know, the cars that we have are pretty neat nowadays. Mine's too old to have this feature, but if you get, some of them have the feature where if you get out of the lane, you cross that white line, it vibrates. You see, you're, you're getting off track, and you straighten up. Now, we do have beside the roads those little grooves that will make our tire vibrate, and that warns us that you get, get, watch it, get back over where you need to be. 
we don't have that built in to our spiritual guidance system. But we can have it if we'll just remember what James says about getting away from Satan and drawing it near to God. We're going to sing a song about God's faithfulness and his love. And in that song, we are told that we can't stand on our own. But we can stand with God. And we can be safe in his loving arms. Let's remember that as we stand and sing our song. Faithful love flowing down from the dark colored ground makes me old, saves my soul, washes white. Faithful. 